I was a fool to think that this job was just a job. Everything from the advertisement to going and actually applying was way too trivial and inviting. I'm trying to tell myself that I'm going to be okay, but I just don't know. I have some time before it happens, so I'll try to explain how fucked I am. In light of the pandemic that's been around for more than a year at this point, I was extremely tight on money. Having moved out of my parents' house right before Corona started shutting down businesses and any possible sources of income for me was bad enough, but being a college student on top of that was absolutely not helping my case. For the longest time, after leaving California I lived in one of those $15 a night, ran down motels while attending ASU, and life was undeniably a struggle. Cheap housing was fine. I could tolerate the dank and stained mattresses provided in the rooms, granted I had been smart enough to take some washable sheets and comforters, as well as febbers from home. I probably washed those daily cause of how hot it'd get in those old, barely ventilated rooms. The real problem came from the crime. In the city of Tempe, Arizona, there were almost 1,000 cases of burglary in the year 2019 alone. Now, granted at that time, the stat didn't scare me because I thought I'd be living in the dorms on campus. So, me as a high school senior thought nothing of it. But here I am. Four nights before I ended up in my current situation, there was a case of breaking and entering reported from the floor under mine. Someone was apparently abducted and had literally everything taken. The only items that remained were their toothbrush still neatly placed by the sink of the small bathroom attached to the main room, and the key to the room, which had the name of the person staying there scribbled onto the paper tag. Even their bed sheets were taken, strangely enough. Maybe criminals need hostages and clean bed sheets. Needless to say that was enough motivation for me to start making some better financial decisions. I went to through four job interviews over the course of the next three days. I was turned down by all four. They said I lacked intuition. Yesterday morning, however, I came across a neatly organized advertisement online, from a company by the name of MORD. The bold font stood out from my computer screen, detailing, no experience required great pay call for interview. From the other advertisements I was looking at, I chose to pursue this one. I felt almost as if it was calling to me or maybe it was beaconing my bank account. I called there and then, and after a few rings of the dial tone, the sound of a young woman came through. Hello there, are you calling about the job advertisements we put out recently? She asked gingerly. Hey, um yeah actually, I am. I would, like to schedule an interview. For later today. I stumbled with my words. At times I find it hard to talk to people, and the quarantine was not helping me be any less socially awkward. Is that alright? I asked cautiously. Oh, eager are we now, that's no problem. Can I have your name? It's for filing purposes. She responded, clicking keys on her keyboard. She responded quickly. It somehow made my brain tick, but I ignored it, as best I could. Yeah, it'll be Jason, Brody. Fabulous. I could practically feel that woman smirking at me. The rest of the phone call was somewhat uneventful. I was told the job was hosted in a town somewhat far away from Tempe. For your own safety I won't tell you which town. I was told I could show up to their facility around 8pm. This left me the rest of the day to contemplate my decision. I had somehow just then realized I didn't even ask what I would be doing at the job. I didn't ask for the girl's name either. Come to think of it, I have never heard of a company by the name of MORD owning such a big plot of land out where they were located. What did MORD even stand for? At that point, I couldn't really care less. I had dollar signs waving in my face, so I hastily went for it. Too bad. So sad I thought, as I went to prepare for later. I gathered the best clothes I could and took the evening bus to a stop relatively close to the property. 
Their facility was sizable, reminiscent of an office building, situated out away from everything. It was essentially a desert out here, even though the more urban areas were probably 45 minutes away. Still, there were some buildings scattered out along the road. MORDs, however, was strangely pronounced. Compared to the other dusty buildings, this one looked weirdly clean and pristine in the evening sun. As I got to the front entrance of the building, I was greeted with a reception area. The walls were painted in a bright and reflective shade of white, with black trim which met a marvelous red carpet with black and white patterns etched into it. It reminded me a casino show floor. In the mostly empty and spacious room were some white leather couches, some pillars spread equally across the expanse of the room, and some houseplants in the corners. A young, blonde girl worked the front desk. Mr. Brody, I presume, called the girl. Yeah, I'm here, you must be who I spoke with earlier. I responded, doing my best not to stutter. Although the girl's facial features were hidden by a blue surgical mask, she seemed pleasant. Her name played red on it. Not even a last name. Alright if walk down that hall over there, it'll be the first room to the right. She pointed her finger to a hallway to the right of me. Much thanks, I replied. By her voice, I assumed she was probably in her early twenties, probably working some lame job to gather money, similar to how I was. Inside of the room was a wooden desk and some chairs. The decorative pattern of the lobby also seemed to flow into office rooms as well. On the desk, laid a piece of paper and an envelope. Cautiously, I took up the paper. It read, M-O-R-D insert address here. Room 2. Good evening, Jason. It is truly unfortunate that I couldn't see you in person before you start. As you should know by now, you will be working overnight in our facility as an overnight guard. As mentioned in the advertisement, the pay should be satisfactory. You will receive $1,500 US per working night. Your uniform can be found on the chair behind you, in the corner. You will find your post for tonight using the map of the building provided on the back of this page. Be at your post by 11.30 p.m. tonight. You may spend the time leading up to your shift in any way you'd like. Do not go down the stairs, said Aaron. I laughed at the last comment. Way to be ominous, I thought. It was about 8 p.m. then, so I decided to get some rest in before my shift. I slept in the chair where I had originally picked up my uniform. The pay was enough to cover my tuition in a matter of weeks. No way I was turning back. My alarm rang at 11.20 p.m. I shot up, put on my uniform, and followed the detailed fiber escape route map of the building to my post. Aaron had kindly used a red marker to guide me through the hallways. I arrived at my post by 11.26 p.m. Just enough time for me to take a quick glance at the rules. I figured that since I'd been hired on this spot, I was in no rush to fret over these. The paper contained a list of 14 rules. The first rules were modest. Rule 1. From a time period of 11.30 p.m. to the end of your shift at 6 a.m., you must walk the ground floor's perimeter twice. You may choose the intervals at which these patrols happen. Easy. Rule 2. From a time period of 2 a.m. to 3.33 a.m. you must take a patrol of the second floor. Walking the perimeter suffices as a patrol. Oddly specific. Rule 3. You will also be tasked with observing the CCTV cameras stationed around the building. If you observe anything you would consider abnormal, please use the phone in your room to contact the front desk. They will know what to do. Connection number, number 999. I sighed. It's whatever I thought. Must be some new guy hazing ritual. Reminds me of when my old burger joint used to decorate for Halloween. Oddly spooky. I laughed internally. Maybe they're just reusing some old supplies from Halloween. It's March though. I shrugged it off. Taking a look at my watch. It was now 11.30. I was officially on the clock. 
Looking up, I observed the room I had been stationed in. In contrast with other rooms on the first floor, the red carpet, that had been present throughout the greater part of the building, did not go past the door frame. Rather, this room had a bleak gray carpet, the color reminiscent of wet concrete. The walls of this room were faded white. Numerous maroon stains laid in contrast from the color of the wall. Some long stains even followed onto the ceiling. Exactly across from the metal door was an industrial metal table. On the table sat 12 monitors, stacked 4x3. Next to the pile, laid a beige office phone. In the corner of the room to my right were four blue lockers. In the other corner of the room there was a small yellow bin with something black inside of it. Classy. Flipping around, I decided to go out for my first patrol right off the bat. I took the envelope with the rules and kept treating. Rule of four, for your own safety, before exiting your room for a patrol, look through all of the camera feeds. Then refer to rule three. Well shit. I found it almost comical that this company was talking about my safety, after all. Aren't I supposed to be the most dangerous thing in the building? I'm pretty sure I saw a baton in the bin. I didn't grab it though. I found it funny how I kept messing up. Legitimately comical. Rule 5. While on patrol, you might encounter rooms where the doors are open and people are seemingly moving inside, but the lights inside the room are turned off. Do not enter these rooms. Do not shine your flashlight in these rooms. They don't like light. I stopped dead in my tracks, almost falling over with how hard I planted my feet into the ground. I read the rule over two more times, thinking I has misinterpreted it, or something. I started to feel the creeping sensation of fear enter my body. Logically, this had to be a prank. Had to. I had too many thoughts to portray onto this note, but I kept reading. Rule 6. If you are on patrol, and you encounter one of these rooms, and something seems to be exiting the room, do not look at it. If you must, stare at the ground and walk backwards until you can turn around, and get back to your room quickly. Refer to Rule 3, before finishing that round of patrol. Rule 7. If you are in your room and you hear scratching at your door, almost as if a pet were beckoning to be let in, do not open the door. If the scratches intensify, you must ignore them. Do not attempt to look out the small window in the door. It is best if you keep your back to the door. Or late. If you notice that one of the cameras in your room has gone black or has started to show static, you must take the baton that was provided to you and smash the screen of the monitor. It can get in, otherwise. Try to smash only the screen. The top of the monitor frame is labeled accordingly to where the camera was displaying. You must avoid that area whenever patrolling. Rule 9. If you sense something is following you, run into your room. Chances are it can't get past the door. Rule 10. If something manages to break into your room, remain completely and utterly still wherever you are and drop whatever you are doing. Do not open your eyes. It will try to coerce you. Rule 11, at no point before 6 a.m. should you consider leaving the premises of the building. You are locked in for your safety. I sharply inhaled upon the realization that I was locked in. This was undeniably the fastest my heart has ever beat. I was practically gauging on my own tongue. I wanted to say something to calm myself down, but couldn't find words. I managed to get a hold of myself soon after, until the ground floor's lights shut off. I was surrounded by darkness. I stumbled backwards a few steps to find the wall of the hallway. I was utterly blinded by the darkness. I fumbled with the utility belt of my uniform, trying to find which small pocket housed a flashlight. I got a hold of it after a moment, switched it on, and all I could think to do was look around me. Wide-eyed, I turned several 360s before considering taking a step forward to trudge onward. The lights must be on a timer I thought. Shining my light onto my black analog watch, the time read 11.40 pm. This is absolutely terrible. As subtle as a mouse, I creeped onward. In a foot race, 
and Anne probably could have beat me to the end of the hallway. I hadn't realized it before, but this building was quite expansive. In each hallway, there seemed to be doorways to at least 25 rooms total, and the hallways were probably each 150 feet long. The building was laid out like a grid, with hallways connecting at certain intervals every now and again, making it easy to navigate, since there were all right angles. Having not encountered anything for the first 10 minutes of creeping, I quickened my pace to a slow walk. Surprisingly, I made a complete perimeter of the ground floor in about 45 minutes, while not having seen anything. Perhaps it's because I didn't dare to make a sound, or look at anything but the hallway in front of me, but I made it back to my room safe. I peered around the room, nothing seemed to be hiding inside. Stepping in, I closed the door behind me. My watch read 12.44 a.m. Suddenly, the office phone on the table blared its ringtone. Almost stumbling over from a heart attack, I inched closer to the phone. I put my hand on the handle, and held the speaker to my ear. The voice of a man came through. Hello, how are you? Asked the man in deep and slow voice. Um, it's good, who are you? Ignoring my question, the man continued, what do you believe in? Static from the phone erupted briefly. Wait, I ah, uh, what do you mean? I was sufficiently flustered, like religion. I'm atheist. There was a brief pause. What is your name? Asked the man. He sounded cold and lifeless now. There was no inflection left in his voice. His breaths were shallow like his diaphragm could no longer push enough air out of his mouth. Jason. The man's voice became distorted past what I could ever possibly try to describe. It was similar to someone choking or gargling on some thick liquid. It hurt my heart to hear somehow, but it was talking to me through the distortion. I didn't know what it was saying. The phone line cut. It was eerily silent around me now. And then it dinged on me. I whipped the envelope out and scanned the rules for anything mentioning a phone. I read. Rule 13. If the phone in your station begins to ring, you must answer it. Answer any questions it may ask. If it hangs up before you do, resume duties. If it asks for your name, do not answer. Hang up and resume duties. My heart dropped. I really had nothing running through my head right at that moment, other than dread. From the silence, came a knock at the room's door. I flipped around instantly to face it. Before taking a step forward, I looked at the paper with rules again. Rule 14. If there is knocking coming from the door to your room, it is most likely the result of not following one of the previously mentioned rules. Refer to Rule 7. If the handle to the door begins to jingle, refer to Rule 10. I looked up to the door. The handle to the door had silently been turning, and I had not noticed. I gasped and dropped the envelope somewhere on the ground from surprise. I instantly shut my eyes and crouched down, trying to find it, by feeling the ground. I heard the door start to creak open, its metal hinges squeaking. Planting both hands on the carpet, I prepared for what was about to unfold. What I felt at first was a strange orb. It became seemingly colder inside of the room, but my body remained warm. Strange sensations coated my arms and legs, the kind where it tingles, and you'd expect to find a spider crawling on you, but there's nothing there. My head felt unfathomably hot compared to the other parts of my body. That's when it spoke. Its voice was reminiscent to that of the thing that spoke to me on the phone, however it was not gargling. It had the same vocal tone as the thing on the phone, but this time it spoke with inflection and an accent. It sounded human. Hey, it's okay, open your eyes and come with me. It repeated that phrase several times, and then, almost as if it were perplexed by why I wasn't responding, it started speaking again. This time in German. Kom schon fremd. Es geht nix zu befrucht. Lass uns gehen. Bit off und dein Augen dort. And then in what I assumed to be Russian. And then in an Asian language I did not recognize. And then it went silent, 
but the feeling in my body was still present, along with the intense cramping of my muscles. I did not dare open my eyes. I remained in my crouched position for seemed like an eternity. When the sensations in my body subsided, I finally mustered up the courage to open my eyes. There was no monster, from anything I could see. The door remained wide open. The light that illuminated my small room of salvation spilled into the hallway outside. I shot up and closed the door as quickly and quietly as I could, somehow thinking that it might still be outside somewhere. I don't remember exactly how I felt, but deprived of oxygen from forgetting to breathe is somewhat accurate. I was sweating profusely and trying to get a hold of my breath. My watch read 1.02 am spotting the envelope on the ground. I bent over and went to review the rules. Glancing over the ones I've already read, I recalled the cameras. Looking to the table, I began to switch on the monitors one by one, with the small on-off button next to the label of where the camera was shooting. All camera feeds displayed seemingly still images of the long dark hallways. Except for one, which displayed one room in a hallway with the lights on inside. I figured this must have been the camera shooting footage of my hallway, and that illuminated room was the one I was in. The label on the monitor read Hallway 4. Correlating that to the map Aaron had given me, it seems I was mistaken. I was located in Hallway 3. I seeming as none of the rules I had read so far mentioned the lights being on, I looked down to the phone, to call the front desk. Before picking up the receiver, I hesitated almost as if the monster from earlier would start asking questions again. But I dialed 9 three times and a dial tone began to sound. After three tones, the voice of the young man came through. Hello, front desk representative speaking. He spoke with a distinct southern accent. Hey, there's a, well in hallway number 4, there's a room with a light on. I responded, trying to keep it together. Almost snottily. The man retorted, is that truly abnormal? There are consequences for calling this line without a reason. I did not enjoy his tone. You listen to me, I have seen my fair share of fucking abnormal tonight, don't you try to tell me. He gave in after my one sentence verbal assault. We'll send someone over. However, I don't think that southern ass ever sent anyone. I never saw anyone walk through that hallway for the next 20 minutes. I guess I'll figure it out myself I thought. Before I left the room, I remembered to grab the baton that sat in the bin in the corner of the room. Opening the door, I peered out, looking left and right as if I were crossing a street, and I headed over to hallway 4. Nothing seemed to be out of place, though. No doors were open, and all the lights remained off. I guess I've made it this far, might as well do my second Through the rest of my patrol, I encountered two of the rooms described by Rule 5. I heeded the warning of the rule, and simply walked past the room without investigating inside. Those rooms were truly strange though, walking past the room, it sounded similar to the inside of a populated Muller train station, where there was a lot of bustling. I took a quick glance inside one of these rooms as I passed it in the hallway. Through the darkness I could see movement but I could not relate it to anything I could comprehend. It had the form of a black mass, swirling around. Moving on, I walked down a flight of stairs, figuring I'd do an extra good job, and continue onward everything seemed darker down there, but it was reminiscent of a copy of the ground floor from what I could remember. My feet made a small squishing sound while walking. The floor seemed to be slightly flooded by a thin layer of water. I felt like I had bad night blindness down there. My flashlight seemed to losing power as well, or something to that extent, because the beam dimmed the further I walked. It smelled old rotting wood, and rusty metal. It was also quite humid, like an indoor swimming pool. I felt some of the water from the ground soak my running shoes. My hands were starting to get clammy, and the air seemed to get heavier with each step, compressing my chest, making it hard to breathe. I looked at my watch. It seemed to have stopped working as well. The time remained frozen at 1.07 am, but I knew it was way later than that though. I stopped where I was, and leaned against one of the hallway's walls. Pulling out the envelope, I gazed upon the rules. 
Rule 12 was quite vague. Rule 12, you are always being deceived. Remember, this left me quite confused. I flipped over the rules paper. Written in a pronounced bold font sat Rule 15. Rule 15, do not go down the stairs. A basement floor does not exist on this building. Upon descending the stairs, your safety cannot be guaranteed. In fact, our company does not know exactly what happens upon descending the stairs. We only know the result. Thus, we do not yet understand how to effectively combat this. You have a limited amount of time to pray to your deity of choice, because you have just entered a portal to the fourth circle of hell. M.O.R.D. I felt my legs give out a little. I looking to the darkness ahead of me, behind me and all around me, I yelled from fear, and backtracked as fast I could. I jumped up three stairs at a time, and hauled absolute ass back to my room. I ripped the lockers in the corner of the room from the wall, and barricaded the door. I already tried redialing the phone. No one picked up. I don't know what's approaching me, but I can feel it. It's different than the creature which knocked on the door. My body is in pain, aching, and writhing, burning. I can sense it, and it can sense me. It's coming to take me. I can see it in my head, dark and disfigured, eyeless, pale, soulless and satanic. I am scared. I don't know what to do. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't understand why this is happening to me. Please, whoever may be reading my warning, if you ever agree to a job that seems too good to be true, it is.